We're going to wrap up the video lectures this week talking about, about a topic that doesn't really have to do with this guidelines that I discussed earlier um, and actually goes a little bit more in depth than a lot of the other things that we were doing. It's getting a little bit more technical. But I want to talk about this because I always have some students who want to do this pretty quickly. So the topic is scales, and we'll go through some of this, but what understanding scales and how to work with them, what that can do for you is it can help if you want to change from the default colors, for example, for how you're mapping out colors, or from the default size or, or pieces like that. And it turns out that for some people, they want to be able to do that pretty early. So don't be too worried if this is getting a little bit too technical for, right, for you for right now. I do want you to watch it and I want you to try to absorb some and we'll have some practice where we try it out some. But also, this is a fine piece if you want to wait to really master it for later in the course once you've mastered some of the other pieces of ggplot and are feeling generally comfortable with all these different layers we have started talking about adding. So there are a number of different functions for adjusting scales. Many of them follow a certain convention. We'll look at some others that follow different ones. And so I, I'm not sure that I've completely mastered the logic behind the naming conventions for these. But certainly some of them will follow this pattern, where the name of the function has scale and then an underscore. And then it'll have a name for that aesthetic, so like x or y or, or color or, or something like that, what you're mapping the column to when you map the aesthetics and then an underscore, and then the type of data that's in the vector that you would use for that. So if it's continuous or if it's discrete, something like a factor. So for example, if we want to make changes to the x-axis for a variable that is continuous rather than discrete like a factor, then we can do scale underscore x underscore continuous, and that will add that as a layer again to our ggplot, and it will let us do a lot of customizations there. Now we've already looked at one simple customization based on these different scales, and that is to change the name of them. For the x and the y axis, what that's going to look like is changing that axis label. And what it'll look like for something like color or size is it will change the label for the little legend that you get that shows how that maps to, to, um, to the different values that you're showing with it. So you can use xlab or ylab or that more general labs function to make those kinds of changes just to the name. But if you want to go in and do much more detailed changes, you really need to go into these scale type of functions. So we're going to use an example where we're mapping several aesthetics. We'll use the World Cup data again. So if you go through and look at the very first video in this chapter, it shows how to set up this data. And if you want to follow along, you'll want to go back to your code there and make sure that it's up and running so you have these different data sets available. Now the example that we're going to do here is we're going to take the World Cup data and we're going to create a scatter plot with that. So we've just piped in the data. We've got that first element that we need for the graph. The next is we want to do our mapping. And we'll do for the different aesthetics, let's see. Let's do that the x position is time, the y position is passes, color is position, and then the size is the shot. So we can do that with time, and then y equals passes. Color is the position, and then size is the shots. And just as a reminder, if we look at this data set, and I'll come down here and use head since it's not in that table class, it's in a classic data frame. So if I just print it by itself, everything prints out. So this is how we can look at just the beginning. And as a reminder, each of these aesthetics, what we're mapping it to is the name of the column that we want to show with that. So for time, we want to show this time column and we're going to show it based on the position along the x-axis and so on. So let's do that and then we can add some points. And we'll set the constant aesthetic in this case. We'll give them a little bit of transparency so we can see all the points there. So let's run this. Oh, I need to make sure I have that going. And I think I have a typo here. There we go. So here we're showing this plot. And we've got default values right now for each of our different scales. So for example, the color is defaulting to the default color choices. And we'll look in a little bit about how to change those using some of these scale functions. 
but we've also got things like our x and y axis even to the point of little pieces like um, where they're putting these minor and major grid lines so the major grid lines are the ones that have a number underneath and then the minor ones are the ones where we can still see a grid line but there's not a number underneath we can use scale X continuous to show some of those values to make changes and customizations to what we have on the X axis along this plot. So we're picking this particular scale function because we're, we want to change some of the things that are happening on the X axis. And right now we're mapping that aesthetic to show a continuous value, a numeric value. So some of the things we might wanna change are the name of that. And we can do that with this name call. We might also want to change where the breaks are and where the minor breaks are. Those are these ones underneath. What I've done here, and this is based on what's going on in our data, that it is data of soccer games that tend to happen, um, tend to, to take 90 minutes. It seems like it might be meaningful to set the breaks to be kind of at 90 minute intervals. And so we might want to put the major breaks um, like 180 and so on right down here and then have minor breaks at the 90 position marks in between. So you can use scale X continuous to set all of those values. Let's go through and take a look here. So we've got our plot that we created before and now we can add scale X continuous. So we can put in things like name and so we might want to put time but then add the units as well. So if we look just at that, you can see now that it's changed that. Now we could have done that with labs or with XLab, but if we're gonna do other things too, we might as well go ahead and do this whole scale X continuous. The next thing that we can do is the breaks. This, this is setting where the major breaks are. And in this case, I'm gonna be a little bit fancy. I'm gonna say that I want it at 90 minute intervals, but then we'll do it um, times two, four, and six. So we get it kind of every other one. If we evaluate just this part of it, you can see that that's going to give our major breaks at 180, 360, and 540. If we look through, you can see that it's added those there. It looks like by default, maybe put the minor breaks in where we want them, but we can specify just to be sure. So we want those minor breaks to be kind of like the in-between spots for 90. So we'll do 90 times the vector of 1 and then 3 and then 5 and again just as a reminder what that will evaluate to is 90 minutes 270 minutes and 450 so we can run that and now we've got all those parts customized there are a number of parameters that often show up in scale functions that you might find useful those include the name which allows you to specify the name of that scale the breaks and the minor breaks, which lets you say where to put those two kind of like specifications for, for where we're labeling the breaks. You can put in labels if you wanted to put something other than the, the default number that shows up or the default factor level that shows up in the, in the main um, column. And then you can also put limits if you wanted to expand your limits so that, for example, you include zero, or if you wanted lower limits to really highlight part of your data, you can use limits in the scale function to set that. You can also use scale functions to work with things like dates. So this is an example using our time series of uh, the, the deaths in Chicago in July 1995. So here I'm using a GM line to show that, and we're showing the date on the x-axis and deaths on the y-axis. So let's add that in. All right, so we'll do aesthetics, we'll do date, and then y is the number of deaths. And then instead of doing a GM point, this time we'll do a line, a line to show that. That's wrong. I think we'll shift July. All right, there we go. So now we've got this plot. Our x axis is a variable that's in that date time. So we can adjust that sum if we want, but in that case, we'll again use that idea that we talk about scale first, and then we say which aesthetic it's on. In this case, it's on the x aesthetic, or it's mapping to the x aesthetic. But in this time, it's a date for our class of the data that we're showing underneath. So we'll need to use that date. Now we can still do name 
and let's do um, date in July of 1995. So right now it's just got the column name, which was originally date in that data frame. But if we run this, you can see it's done that nicer column name. One of the nice things when we work with the scales for dates is we could change the format too. Right now you can see it's doing JUL for July and then 03 and 10 and so on. Instead we can set, I believe it's format. No, sorry, it's date labels here. So we can set the state labels. And for those, we'll use these special conventions, like these special codes they have for how you express different um, elements of a date and time. So if we look up scale x date, the help file for that, I believe it'll give us some leads on how to go through and do that formatting. So we have the date label section right here, and that specifies it's, it needs to be a string, so it needs to be something in quotation marks that uses specific formatting specifications to show those different elements. If you click on this link it gives you, then we can go through and it'll give us some more tips on that. So here are all of the different abbreviations. And there are things like an abbreviated weekday or a full weekday or so on. So we can go through and maybe what we want here is the full month name. So that's going to be percent B. And maybe we want a space then. So we'll put in a space in that string. And then after that, maybe we want the day. And so that's this if we want it with like zero one. But we might also want to play around and find which one we want in terms of like if we don't want that zero. For right now, we'll do that, but again, you could pick out just about any element that you wanted by going through these codes. So I'll do that as that day. All right, so let me go back to the plot, and I'll remind you this is what this axis look like in terms of the labeling right now. And now what we've done is we've changed so it's spelling out the full name. We could do some other things too. Let's go back to that help file and let's see other ways we could express the month. So we could do month as a decimal number using this lowercase m. So that's another thing that we could do if we want it. We could do the m and then a hyphen, or we could even do a forward slash if we wanted to have like 07 and a forward slash and then the, the day of year. So if we look at that now, now you see it's changed it. So it's having July 3rd expressed as 07 forward slash 03. You can also use these to transform an axis, and this can be useful in a lot of cases. We don't have a natural example in the data we're working with right now, so I've done one that's just a little bit forced. But many of you, especially who work with biological data or with engineering data sets, might find this useful quite a lot of the time. So we might want to use like a log 10 way of showing one of the dimensions of our data. And we can add that by doing this log 10 at the end. So this is doing scale y for the y aesthetic is the one we're changing. And then the log 10 will actually transform it so that the distance between things are changed to follow that log 10 um, expression. So, so far we've been talking a lot about these pieces for customizing some of the elements like the breaks. But a lot of times what you want to do is to customize the color. And for those, the names of the scale functions can vary. This is where these naming conventions um, get a little bit kind of like a, more spread out and a little harder to fit into a neat box. So for example, when you're adjusting a color scale, if you're mapping a discrete variable, like a factor, to color, for that you need to use scale color hue. But then if you're working with a continuous variable, a lot of times you might use scale color gradient. A lot of times these are things that I will look up when I need to use them. These aren't pieces that I have kind of readily at hand. Instead, I'll do a Google search for how you adjust some of these different scales to make sure that I remember the, night, the right call. For color scales, there are a number of different ones you can try. Later in the class, we'll use a wonderful one called Veritas, and that one has a lot of nice features, like it, it, it's safe for people who have the most common types of color blindness, and it's all, it also retains kind of like its distinctions when you print it out in black and white when you use kind of a gray scale. Another one that's really great, it's especially good for maps, is called the, uh, the 
the Brewer palette. So there's actually a whole website for this and we'll be using scale color Brewer as we work through it. But I would suggest you take a look at these palettes at the website. And what this lets you do, it gives you an example map and it lets you kind of play around with these different palettes. So you can click and see what it would look like with different examples. And you can also go down and you can change um, the, the number of different variables that you would be using. Oh, sorry, it's up here now. So if we knew that we were going to need to have kind of seven different distinctions instead of three, you can change that and still try to get an idea of how this will look when you try to distinguish among them. These palettes fall into three general categories and you'll see them mentioned on the website. Those are sequential, divergent, and qualitative. So I can walk through what each of those mean, starting from the right over here. Sequential tend to go from a light color to a fuller color as you go up. Whereas divergent tend to have the lightest colors in the middle and then are moving towards two stronger colors on either end. Both of these tend to be used for continuous data or for data that's kind of in, in a row where things that are close to each other in value should have a pretty similar color. The other thing that can be useful is qualitative, and this is really when you're trying to show something that can fall into different categories. So that will often be something that's a column that's saved as a factor type in your data. These are really trying to use colors that are easy to distinguish from each other. So when you have those different categories, it's pretty easy to see all the different colors. In R, there is a package called R Color Brewer that will let you use these different scales. And those include a function called Display Brewer Pal. Pal here stands for palette. And that lets you see the different palettes that they have. So these are some of the names of the palettes and it's allowing you to see those. The N in this case is how, saying how many different categories you're going to have or how many different breaks you're going to have for that. So how many separate colors you should be able to ultimately see. Here I've shown some examples of using that. Again, all that you have to do is take your ggplot object and then add on one more layer that's got this color scale on it. So in this example, I've created a pretty simple different um, a scatter plot with five different points and then I've added on letters in the alphabet using a, a, a vector that comes with base R called letters that gives all the lowercase letters. So this is just pulling out the first five of those. If you look at this, we can do the original plot using the default values, but then to change those colors we can add on this scale. And so in the first case, I'm adding on to use set one, and then in the second to use pastel two. And here, because these colors are light, I've also added a dark theme so you can see them well. Within this scale function, you can also include things like the, um, the name specification to change the name on that. So here I've done name equals player position, and you can see that that's changed the name for the color legend over here. Finally, sometimes people just want to set the colors exactly to their own value, and you can do that. You can manually set the colors by using the scale color manual. And in that case, you say what values you want, and it will line those up if you're using a, a factor based on the, the order of the levels for that factor. So here I'm saying that the colors I wanna use are blue, green, dark green, and dark gray, and those are again using the R colors. They're the specifications for R color names. And you can see here that that set that up as those different um, those different values. So I'll just wrap up for this chapter with some, some really excellent references for going further. There is loads that you can do plotting with ggplot and using R in general to create visualizations. As we go through the class, we'll do, be doing more with that, and especially as you work on your group projects at the end of the class, we'll be going really deeply and trying to think about how you visualize your data. But I think this is an area where you should continue to try to learn and grow as you continue working in R. So I encourage you, once you feel like you've mastered some of these first pieces that we're talking about, that you go and look at some of these other resources and learn some more.
So some of those include uh, one of the chapters of R for Data Science, which is available as an online book or a print copy, and I put the online uh, version there. There's also a wonderful book that's just come out a year or two ago uh, by Kieran, Kieran Healy that's called Data Visualization. Again, there's a print version of that, that that's a very reasonable price, and then there's also a complete online version of the book that you can use. Winston Chang has created one called the R Graphics Cookbook that's really nice because it goes through, and if you look through the table of contents, it's really divided by task. So you can look through and scan that for the task you're trying to do, and then you go and you get very discreet instruction to how to, on how to do that one specific thing. It really is like a cookbook. Again, there's a version of that online as well. I also find it very useful sometimes to Google and then search rather than the Google search results, look through the Google image results. Because if you can see something that looks like the, what you want to plot, the type of genome you want to plot, or the way you want your color to look, or the way you want your scales to look, there are a lot of wonderful examples that people have put out in blog posts and in other things online that show how they wrote up our code to achieve that. And a lot of times the way to find that is to look through the images until you see something along the lines of what you're trying to achieve and then go look at that. If you ever want the more technical details about what's going on under the hood for some of this, both for ggplot and for our plotting in general, two excellent resources are the ggplot 2 book, which was written by Hallie Wickham, and then our graphics, which I think is in its third edition right now, by Paul Murrell. Uh, both of these are available if you're at CSU through our library, I believe through um, our online books, but then also again both of these are things that are available in print.